Good evening. I am Kim Mack, District Director for Congressman Don, Day Don Davis. We are delighted to be in Greene County this evening for a town hall. The first congressional district consists of 19 counties, and Greene County is one of the 19 and home to U.S. Congressman Don Davis and his family. Tonight's town hall is an official event hosted by the United States House of Representatives. Therefore, no candidates running for political office will be recognized, nor can any campaign questions be answered this evening. However, we would like to recognize any elected officials in the audience. If you are an elected official, please stand and state your office. Don't all stand at one time. <laughs> okay, we'll start over here. Back. Mary Perkins Williams, the County Board of Commissioners, and I'm not a candidate. Mike Sides for Brooklyn County Chair. Brandon Johnson, Vice Chairman of Brooklyn County School Board. Dennis Lyles, Mayor of Snowy. Lorraine Washington, Town Commissioner, Snowy Hill Town Commissioner. Derek Burks, Green County Commissioner. Rosie Wilkes, Town Commissioner, Mayor Cook. Thank you for your service to our communities. Let's all give them a round of applause. The Congressional Office is located in Greenville, North Carolina. The Congressional Office is nonpartisan. We provide the following services. Congressional casework. Each Congressional Office has a designated casework team that acts as a liaison between constituents of the district and federal agencies to work through whatever issues the constituents are having. We are a neutral third party in the process. Case workers cannot advocate or change a particular outcome or decision. Some wait periods for responses can be as long as 60 to 90 days, but federal agencies are required to respond to our inquiries. Our office cannot get involved in any judicial matter. Some of our more popular issues where constituents request assistance are the Department of the State with passport assistance, the IRS, the Department of, and the Department of Veteran Affairs. Constituent wins include over 3.5 million returned to Eastern North Carolinas last year. We also had over $260 million grant dollars that came back to the first congressional district. And we had a submission of over 16 million projects in community project funding. Constituent outreach. We have a fantastic outreach team working in the field. We meet with elected officials, civic groups, nonpartisan groups, nonprofits, and other constituent groups. We strive to be of assistance and provide support. Congressional educational opportunities for youth. Students who live or attend school in the first congressional district are eligible to participate in the congressional opportunities for youth. The opportunities include the congressional art competition, the app challenge, and military academy nominations. College students can also compete for internships in our district or DC office. More information can be found on our website. We also provide press releases to local media and social media posts when opportunities open for students to apply and compete. Come to Nations and Greetings. If you would like to request the Congressional District to be in support of a special event that you're having in your life, please reach out to us. 
Some activities include family reunions, church anniversaries, retirement celebrations, uh, many events where people are able or may want to be recognized by the congressman. Those are examples of some of the events where we provided a special greetings or a certificate or special congressional recognition. Then there's also been opportunities where the congressman has given or provided one minute floor speeches on people in our community, including not too long ago, the chief of police was recognized in a one minute floor speech. Flag request. A constituent can request a flag to be flown over the Capitol. The flag will include a certificate of authenticity, which may be personalized for a particular person, event, or occasion. For example, if somebody is retiring with 25 years of law enforcement, they may request for a flag to be flown over the Capitol in their honor. That's an example. The Congressional Office can also assist constituents with tickets to tour the White House as well as the U.S. Capitol. My only request is that if you make the request for tickets, please try to do so a couple of months in advance so that you will be able to get uh, the time or the date that you might want to get. Federal Grant Assistance. The office provides guidance and key resources to help eligible grant seekers find information on federal grants, loans, non-financial assistance for projects, and private funding. At this time, we have district staff that are present, and I'm going to ask them to please come forward so you could be recognized. Good evening, everyone. I am Seth Woodard. I'm the Deputy District Director and Casework Director for Congressman Davis. In that role, I oversee all casework, but specifically the agencies that I focus on that you'll be most familiar with, Department of State, that's Passports, and the IRS. And as Kim said, just to give you a quick example of the type of IRS issues that we see, there's a department in the IRS called the Errors Department. It's not as funny as it may sound. So whenever someone calls us, wants to know why they hadn't gotten this year's refund yet, we're able to figure it out and oftentimes we'll see that it's in the errors department and we can help push that through and just get it processed just as a type of an example. Some of the other things that you know, we will do, like I said, helping people with their passports if you're traveling on short notice or if you've already applied or, or are unfamiliar with how to apply for a passport, we can talk you through that process. And then, you know, a smattering of other agencies, but I'll turn it over to Cami. Thank you, Seth. I'm Cami Britton, caseworker two. I uh, handle various agencies. Um, the most common requests uh, that I receive in my portfolio Social Security Administration, Medicare, Medicaid, U.S. Postal Service, um, Division of Prisons or Bureau of Prisons, excuse me. Um, hope nobody has an issue there. <laughs> but occasionally we do have a request from there. Um, the, some others scattered here and about the part of education, people want to check on their student loans, uh, repayment, um, FFA, and just whatever else uh, nobody else has. I pretty much have that. Uh, things like Department of Energy, I think I had my second one ever from the Department of Energy Facebook issue. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Lee Kruger. Uh, I work with Military Veteran Affairs uh, Casework. I also do Hispanic Outreach uh, Coordinator, so si tienes asistencia en español, también te podemos ayudar así. So the, basically my caseload is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, military members, active duty, reservists, guardsmen, and also uh, anybody that's served in the military. Uh, I myself have served, I'm an Air Force veteran, retired Coastie, uh, and a disabled veteran myself. So uh, thank you for all for coming out. Thank you, Beth. Before I introduce Congressman Davis, I wanna share with you some guidelines for the question and answer segment of the town hall. Again, this is an official event of the United States House of Representatives. Therefore, this evening, no campaign-related questions will be answered. At the registration table, 
if it's already there written on. At the registration table, you are able to pick one of these up. This is for you to write your question, if any of you have any questions that you would like to share this evening. So uh, we have additional copies of these. So if you raise your hand, if you need one of these, and our staff would be sure to get you one of these forms. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Congressman Davis. Congressman Don Davis was born and raised in Snow Hill, North Carolina. He spent his life answering the call to serve as a veteran, educator, minister, and dedicated public servant. He graduated in 1994 from the United States Air Force Academy and became a commissioned officer with the United States Air Force, where he actively served in uniform for eight years. As a first lieutenant, Congressman Davis coordinated Air Force One and Codale operations at Andrews Air Force Base and supported families of military members as a mortuary officer. Congressman Davis returned to Eastern North Carolina as an assistant professor of aerospace studies at East Carolina University Air Force ROTC Detachment 600 where he taught national security affairs, military history, and leadership courses. As an educator for over 20 years, Congressman Davis has mentored thousands of students as they have completed their studies. As a veteran, Congressman Davis continued his commitment to public service by becoming the youngest mayor of Snow Hill at the age of 29, where he served seven years. In 2008, Congressman Davis was elected to the North Carolina Senate serving six terms. In 2022, Congressman Davis was elected to the United States House of Representatives, representing 19 counties comprising of the 1st Congressional District of North Carolina. Congressman Davis is married to his wife, his wife Ivanka, and they share three sons, Ryan, Justin, and Kyler. Ladies and gentlemen, Please give a round of applause as Congressman Don Davis comes to the podium. start out. Kim gave that big bio. <laughs> now, Green County, you wrote the bio. Y'all know some things in that bio that Kim doesn't even know. Y'all know the name that I grew up, you call me. Don Don. Somebody said, who said Don Don? <laughs> How's it going, Green County? How's it going, Eastern North Carolina? Woo! I'm looking around here, and we've been making our rounds, talking. More importantly, making sure that we are available, accessible, we're being transparent, allowing everyone an opportunity to participate, to engage in this process. So it's so good to see not only Greene County, but I see some from all over Eastern North Carolina that's in the house today. So let's give everybody that's here a big old hand. Now, I don't want this water bottle to be thrown at me. Where, where's Miss Ivanka? She's here. So, there she is. Oh, I knew she was somewhere right here. All right, let's give a hand to Ivanka Davis. Y'all know her. We're actually here at the Tech Center. And right behind us is the pre-K center. <laughs> so um, she knows a little bit about the pre-K center. She's been invested in the young people in this community for a long time. 
And let me say up front, uh, when I see school board members here, this is about the future. This is about our young people. That's why we're here, and that's what we'll talk about today. I would like for, uh, we have so many elected officials. Um, it's been a, a long day, so I'm just asking you to throw your hand up in the air, and let's give all of our elected officials a hand today. Yeah. And there's no way I could come here, um, having served as mayor in Snow Hill, without recognizing the distinguished, the honorable, Dennis Lowes. Stand up. Now, hold on, stand up again, Dennis. Let's stand up one more time, y'all. Now, I want everybody to look at this guy, and I can promise you, he walks more than all of us combined. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. And to all of our elected leaders here, and especially um, our Green County elected officials, I want to thank you, too. Even have my pop here, my father-in-law. That's Shantae's dad. It's good to see you. Absolutely. It's really good to see everybody coming in today. I want to talk, if we may, and give an update about the 118th Congress. There's been a lot going on in Washington, D.C. And I want to share with you that we've been fighting for you. We've been fighting for the people of Eastern North Carolina, and we're going to continue to stay in this fight. My roots grow, grow deep here. I feel as I move across Eastern North Carolina, the 19 counties in this district, there's not one county I go to that's not like family. This is more like family for me. And I'm honored that you allow me to serve as your representative in the United States House of Representatives. The 118th Congress. Let me say, when I started in the 118th Congress, this is what we knew. We knew that there were great challenges, in particular here in Eastern North Carolina, with health care. This was the very first issue I started on, and we all understand why. When we look at Eastern North Carolina, and we may have interest in all kinds of issues tonight. But when we think about Eastern North Carolina, we have enormous health care disparities in our part of the state. From infant mortality, as a matter of fact, the reports just came out that infant mortality remains on the rise. And especially as African American women are of concern. We have to continue to stay engaged. But we also see issues with chronic illnesses, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, all the way to life expectancy. If you're living in the East, a life expectancy can be lower than other parts of the state. And let me share this with you. So the plan was to run for office, get elected, and we had been engaging at the table at the state le level dealing with Medicaid expansion. So the plan was we'll go in a special session in December, and then we'll head to Washington. Well, it didn't quite work that way. So we did get elected. December came. December passed. We never had the special session. I showed up in Washington, D.C., and Medicaid expansion was still looming in the state of North Carolina. So right away, I was tasked to be a co-chair of the State Medicaid Expansion Caucus, in Washington, D.C., DC, because there are other states that have not expanded as well. So we went to work. The very first piece of legislation I filed dealt with health care and expanding Medicaid. And I'm glad to share. We continue to go around, hear from residents, speak with our legislators. And yes, on December 1st, 2023, 
the legislators stepped up to the plate here in North Carolina and expanded Medicaid, allowing another 95,000 Eastern North Carolinians access to care. And it wasn't just about an additional 95,000 having access to care. As this builds out, we're talking about another 3,000 jobs, y'all. That's huge for Eastern North Carolina. Uh, jobs are so important, but not only that, we have to respond and answer the question, how do we keep our hospitals open, our healthcare network? We've seen just in the last year alone, the closure of Martin General Hospital. With that closure alone, now residents are having to go in different directions, and it interrupts the overall healthcare system. But this has been the core of the fight that we've been in. And let me share with you the second thing that I began to engage in. Three near government shutdowns. And I want to be clear. There are conversations we must have over our fiscal responsibility and fiscal health. But I can definitely guarantee you and assure you this. When you shut down the government, it'll have an even greater impact in rural eastern North Carolina. So that's why we stood the course to continue to stand up to make sure we kept the government open in each and every one of the votes. I've continued to prioritize young people. Traveled to all 19 counties here in Greene County, all the way to Haskellton, Vance, Going through Nash, Rocky Mount, Edgecombe, Washington, Terrell, talking to young people from little babies to pre K, 12th grade, undergrad, graduate school, and even some who had just graduated, young professionals. See, part of what we do at times, we often go talk to other elected officials. But this was a conversation I thought that was so important to be had with young people. And the question that was on my mind for them is one, how many were planning to stay in Eastern North Carolina? How many felt there were real opportunities here in the East to succeed? I went to every single county because this was so important to me back then. I was in one setting, they brought four classes out. Not a hundred kids, but short of a hundred kids were in school that day. They showed up for school that day. And they had a conversation with their congressman, and I asked them this question. I asked, how many of you plan on staying in East North Carolina? Maybe leaving, going to school, but then coming back. Not necessarily a hundred, but short of a hundred. Put a number in your mind right now for you. Out of that whole group, four, four, four. We're seeing before us so many young people are giving up. And I've gone to graduation after graduation after graduation, and I talk to young people. And this is what they tell me. I'm leaving. I can't wait to leave. And this is not everyone, but I'm saying so many are saying, I want to leave. I'm leaving. And I wish they stopped there. But they don't stop there. They continue on and say, I'm leaving. I don't want to come back. And, and it was just weighing on me, and I asked myself the question, how do you get to a point with a young person that they may feel that they have to leave but not want to come back? And it was because, overwhelmingly, they said to me, and it didn't matter where I was, Warren County, Bertie County, Washington, they all said the same thing. They didn't see real opportunities for themselves to succeed and make it in Eastern North Carolina. 
And I'm sharing this because this is indeed a larger problem and concern that we have to collectively work to address. We have to make Eastern North Carolina more attractive. And therefore, I set out then to look to see what is taking place in the East. And let me share with you. There are a lot of good things that are taking place, but perhaps we're not always doing the best job of telling our stories. Travel to Elizabeth City State University, the only four-year aviation science program in the state of North Carolina. I mean, we have the, op the opportunity for kids if they want to, to be an airplane pilot. If they don't want to fly an airplane, they can fly drones, be a drone pilot. We're using drones right now, drone technology to access um, agriculture, water levels, to assess disasters. We're using this technology for all kind of things. I travel to Warren County. Interesting in Warren County, they deactivated their RTC, JRTC program, reactivated, hear this, a Space Force JRTC program. This is one of like 10 in the nation in rural, rural North Carolina, the only one. Why can't we inspire kids for space? Again, to have a conversation going back to Wisdom City State University. Why not look at Maybe a air and space attachment of all of this synergy around aviation. Went to the Center of Energy Education, Halifax County. Talked to the Radiant Race, exposing young people to energy careers. Traveled to, Elizabeth, uh, to Greenville to talk to students graduating out of Broder School. We're getting ready to build a whole new school. And everybody needs to understand what this is all, is all about, okay? Let's work this down. What the Brody School of Medicine is all about is you go from 80 students per year to 120, bringing in another 40. This is the model that we know that works. You go into rural communities, you identify students in our schools, bring them in, expose them to medical education, send them back on a residency. By the way, we just, we were in Roanoke Rapids. We brought three new residents for the first time in Roanoke Rapids. You place them in a residency in rural North Carolina, they start practicing. Where are they likely to stay? This is the concept called growing your own. We have to grow our own, build our own workforce. And we can't give up on this. I'll share with you farmers in particular. Farmers are <laughs> getting pounded on in many ways. Founding it's a more, even more difficult to keep the operations alive. That's what we've seen. I'm also on the House Agriculture Committee. House Agriculture Committee. Went around the district, talking to farmers, talking to those in the agriculture community, working towards the Farm Bill. We work on a Farm Bill every five years. I heard so many concerns and interests, interest in crop insurance, research, marketing, and we are working still on the Farm Bill. And what's become very apparent is we need to get to a good Farm Bill that works, a balanced Farm Bill that works for our agriculture community. Now, I'll share this story with you most recently, and everyone we have to connect to this. Cost is a big issue when it comes to agriculture. Farmers don't necessarily get the control of the cost. In terms of they, you go to a store, the owner can 
adjust the prices. It doesn't work that way in agriculture. So they have to constantly look at what they're doing, their operations. And here's what we understand. So when you then add things on, like a drought that comes, and I, and I share this story with you. So I'm like, it's hot outside. It is super hot. And I'm start walking through the yard and, and the grass is crunching. I'm like, hold on, I need to just go check in with some of the farmers on this, buddy. And indeed, we're already beginning to see damages and loss that's taking place. So here's the deal, and I share this with you. So I called a press conference to meet with farmers to go out in, in the field. The day before the press conference, it rained. <laughs> so I went to the press conference. I said, you know, at this rate, I'm just keep calling press conferences and, and having activities. And I don't know if that's what's causing the rain, but I'll give it to the good Lord. But let me say, even though we see more rain, there were already losses before that. And rain upon loss is not going to recoup the loss. So we still have to be concerned about our farmers. We have to be concerned about labor costs. Uh, we have to be concerned about our black farmers to make sure that we're giving everyone an opportunity um, to make it in agriculture. I'll share this with you. Part of the fight that we've been on, and you've seen me fighting on some really key issues. One, last year was dealing in particular with uh, the ban on menthol. Now, I want to be clear. I understand there are health concerns when we talk about menthol and so forth and smoking. But let me also share another side of this story for hopefully all of us to think about. When we think about menthol in particular, a ban, not just the ban, but the how the ban was being rolled out. Basically, it was go cold turkey. We're not doing anything. No patches, nothing really to help people. But this is what we do know, is if the ban would have taken effect, 6,000 jobs would have been wiped away in North Carolina. I just don't see how you wipe away someone's job and then expect them to live healthier. It actually typically doesn't work that way. And what I was weighing and constantly looking at in this process is how do we balance or at least consider not only physical health, but economic wellness. You have to look at the big picture. And that brings me then to Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. So then the Air Force comes up with this terminology that we use in DC, terminology called divestment. Um, in other words, we're going to divest a squadron of F-15Es at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. My friends, let's peel back the onions on all of this. What we're talking about here is cutting 520 jobs at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in that community. Now, I would beg you to put Eastern North Carolina up on the map and look across our state. Almost all the counties in this district are tier one counties. We're the most economically distressed in the state. So let me put all the perspective on this. On the one hand, we fought for over a decade for 3,000 jobs, and then within months, we're talking about over 6,500 jobs possibly being cut. I just feel we're going in the wrong direction there. And I believe it's important for us to, in these conversations, bring the community into the process, bring industry into the process, and let's see how we can work through these issues. But you can't go into one of the most economically distressed congressional districts in the nation 
and just start ripping away jobs without any alternative. Two things to stand out as the Secretary of the Air Force. What are the alternatives? Congressman, there are none. Ask another question. In this process, do we talk to the people in the community? Yes, he said. I said, name one person. Name one. I want to know somebody in Eastern North Carolina we've had a conversation with. The response is all on the record. I have to get back with you. That's the response. I just want you to know we're here and we're fighting for Eastern North Carolina, our interests, and that's what I'm doing. And that's what I try to do every single day. I live this stuff. This is my why. Been in a fight for our families, for us, and trying to do it in a balanced way. I think that is so important. When we talk about the National Defense Authorization Act, been a member of the Armed Services Committee, that's the major bill that we work on in terms of funding and directing the policy of our military. I was extremely proud that we were able to get a 5.2% pay raise for those men and women serving our country. That is huge, y'all. We hadn't seen a pay raise like that in nearly two decades. This last time around, and I was on what was called the Quality of Life Panel, because what we realized is our junior officers, our junior enlisted, they were not getting the raises at the same rate as some of the senior military personnel. So we pushed and we were able to make a pathway for our junior enlisted to get a boost that they need for their families. And that's the right thing to do, y'all. We've worked on the Camp Lejeune water contamination issue, been a voice to that issue for so many who served. I just believe you sign up to serve for your country. You shouldn't show up to duty and walk away as a result of contamination and the government to walk away. I remember sitting in the committee and I asked uh, this question. Those cases are going through the court, the Eastern District. The retired judge said it would take about a thousand years to adjudicate the cases. I asked the secretary, or who's planning to be around? even 999 years to make sure this is taken care of. This is not acceptable. We began to expedite this process. I'll share with you, there's nothing more important to me than safeguarding our national security, safeguarding you and your families. Travel is in Israel. Kafar Zahad Kibbutz, less than two months before the October 7th occurrence. I was there, standing right, looking into Gaza. We traveled north to the Syrian border. We traveled through the West, West Bank, and basically around the state of Israel. You know, looking at the threats, talking about the threats. But more importantly, at that time, we were talking about peace. They were having accords and, and normalizing ties with Saudi Arabia. And that was interrupted in a mighty way when we saw terrorists that would take their weapons on October the 7th. I traveled to Ukraine spoke to Ukrainian soldiers, even U.S. personnel who were there training the Ukrainian soldiers. Just imagine talking to someone, just a U.S. soldier, been to the front line, wounded four times, and still there. He says, Congressman, we just need ammunition. We just need ammunition. I want to be clear. I think it's important for us to stand to Putin 
and stop pooping. Some may have different thoughts, but I can tell you we're talking less than 5% of our DLD budget, y'all. And I can tell you this. It didn't take the stamps. Because the will of people shift. When the will of people see the super aggression of Putin, then the greatest cost that we will ever have to pay is the price of our sons and daughters. We've been taking this work to heart. Traveled to the border three times, talking through the issues, speaking with Border Patrol agents, speaking with asylum seekers, speaking with those leaders in border communities. And I want to be clear on this. I do believe it's important. Put all the politics whatsoever aside on this. We have to be clear on this. I went to Nogales, Arizona. I went there, and each trip I had a focus. The Gullis of the Tucson sector, they seized 51.4 million fentanyl pills. Two things in particular that stood out. They're color coding the pills to purposely be attractive to our children. Children. Second thing that stood out. Court Director shared, Congressman, I think the fentanyl is the deal. We're seeing more potent cocaine come through. Through drug intelligence, the dominant source of drugs making it into North Carolina is coming from Mexico. We also have to crack down on China. It's real, though. This is real talk. You don't think it's real? Just in Goldsboro, right down the street, four people in April died in three days. If you don't believe me, go talk to the funeral director. This is real. This is real. These are our families. I try to support everything I saw that was moving that was reasonable, that would try to do anything. We have to continue to maintain our commitment to this. I can also say, and just think about this. Go look it up. Anywhere between 30,000 and 40,000 are arrested, drug-related arrests every single year in North Carolina. Every single year. It's impacting our families in many ways, including mine. We have to, y'all. We have to try to figure this out, and we can, and we should. As I think about all that's been going on in Washington, D.C., I want to bring it down even closer to home. We found ourselves working to recognize the Halawasa Pony tribe uh, here in our district, pay tribute to Syracuse Evans. Syracuse Evans, she paved the way for Rosa Parks. North Carolina, she refused to give up her seat on the bus. And she passed also over the course of the year. I can share with you, we've been on the move. I don't want you to think Oh, he's just been traveling all these places overseas. Well, guess what? I've made over 230 stops into counties in the first congressional district. Over 230 stops. And that's to the county, not the movements within the counties. Because it is so important to me to be on the ground, to be the people's representative. Be that voice fighting for all of us on the ground. Our constituent team, uh, and I want to really give a big shout out to Kim Mack. She's our district director. Kim can stand again. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> she shared with you about our services. Our casework team, they've settled over a thousand cases. 
These are residents calling to the office with concerns. And the biggest thing I want everyone to know is that our office is open for you. If you have a concern, you have a thought of a concern, we're here for you. That's what this is about. That's how this process works. I'm so proud. We're able to deliver millions of dollars in community project funds that we move around the district. And let me share with you just today, just today. We started out this morning, headed to Henderson. And we're working as part of the Southeast Crescent Regional Commission. What this commission is in place for is in the South, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, states like this, we know there are pockets of communities that, is, that have historically experienced now enormous economic distress. So what this entity is doing, they're looking at ways to do two things in particular, We're focusing on infrastructure and economic development. So we went to Henderson today. They were having in a community challenges with low pressure of the pump station. Well, we're delivering the help to the community in Henderson. We left Henderson, we went to Warrington, there helping to support a business incubator, trying to make space for small businesses. The small businesses are important. We left there and went down the street to Roanoke Joan Community College. And hear this, Roanoke Joan Community College, they have a welding program, welding to work, weld to work. And let me share partly why that is really near and dear to me and why it's so important. When we look regionally, we have to shore up agriculture. It's our leading industry. We have to secure our military inst installations Defense is our second leading industry. We have to look for new opportunities for our young people. And here's the deal. As a member of the Armed Services Committee, there's no doubt we agree. China's outpacing us with shipbuilding and submarine building. We have to ramp up our pace rapidly. Our pace rapidly. Newport News, the shipyard, they don't have enough capacity. We've been engaging in communication with our community colleges, with our workforce development boards. We're taking a delegation there to take a look at the shipyard. We already know there's over 1,100 North Carolinians working in the shipyard. They need another 3,000 a year. So we're trying to create good opportunities, good opportunities for good paying jobs, because that's what we're hearing. That's what we're trying to respond to. So we're traveling, moving around the district, and I can go through each county and tell you, because what was important to me is putting in place a capital improvement plan, CIP for the district. And I want to make sure I know what the issues and the challenges are so we can address infrastructure, roads, affordable housing, broadband, and these projects that a lot of our communities care about, just like right here in Snow Hill. We're prior prioritizing moving the senior center from its current location to the wellness center. That's something that has been communicate, communicated as something that is of importance of this community. Likewise, we brought over $11 million back into Green County. We're in this fight. We're in this fight for the right reason, and that's for you. I want to let you know that I'm honored, truly honored, to be able to serve, to fight for us, to really look at common sense solutions told you about those kids, everybody wanted to leave. Let me share with you this. Hear this. 
So I spoke to another group of kids. But let me share with you about these. They're apprentices. They're apprentices. Matter of fact, I'll brag because I know Nash County's here. So over in Nash County. Spoke to a group of apprentices. They're one about to say, oh, ask the same question. How many of you plan to stay here? How many might leave and come back? Here it is. 100%. 100%. We have to continue to make these links and these connections. Apprenticeship programs, but not only that, what is really a highlight, and we have to think through, and NAS again, they have pre-apprenticeship programs in place. We have to help kids connect dots. Like the NC Bio program, like the Pitt County. I think it's a great model we need to put on a tour across the district. They look at the students who take work keys, They're taking the work keys. It's an assessment to see their skill sets. They go on and look at certain skill sets within the work keys. They meet up with the students and watch this. Their name's called Graduation Day. They walk across the stage and they know that the next week they're prepared to show up to work. They're seeing it. They're able to see it. And we have to continue to connect these type dots. For me, what is so important, and I love sharing this story because y'all appreciate it, especially here in Green County. Growing up here, my mom was young when I was born. Y'all know my mom. My grandma had a vision, and she knew the importance of education. And I remember all the time she said, baby, once you get it up in here, they can't take away, take it away from you. I grew up on those good Eastern North Carolina values. And she Challenged my mom to go to school. She went to Bennett College, graduated with a math degree. Came back briefly, Procter and Gamble, went on to IBM and Research Triangle. Then later went to Texas. And I moved to Texas with my mom. She eventually retired after over 35 years at IBM. I left Texas. Go to the United States Air Force Academy. Graduated in 94. Served eight years active duty. But some interesting things that humbled me. Serving as a mortuary officer. Coming back home, because no matter where I, I've been, this was always home. Always home. Maintained a North Carolina residency. I was in the military. I couldn't wait to get back and came back. So an assignment at the East Carolina University as an assistant professor of aerospace studies teaching national security affairs courses, military history. And there was nothing more fulfilling than last year we had a reunion. And for those educators, where are the educators? Raise your hand. Let's give all of our educators a hand. <laughs> There's nothing more fulfilling as an educator to see your student success. And to stand there seeing, Rosa, these colonels working at the Pentagon, doing all kind of amazing things for our country. It was then, giving back, and where I'm heading with all of this, I'm raised by my grandmother, propping tobacco, Green County, Mr. Adolph gave me my first job over there. That was after working at Robert Taylor's store over at the game room. Y'all know what I'm talking about here in Green County. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Okay, if you don't know what I'm talking about, y'all know y'all know me. So, but I shared this story. I said for those who don't really understand, I'll tell you how you know I crop tobacco. The way I know I crop tobacco. You get up early in the morning, get hit the dew, sitting in the road, come back, it's dried up, gum all on you. 
Dan riding on the back of the truck. <laughs> See, the law enforcement can't do that to you. <laughs> riding on the back of the truck, coming home for lunch. And we would get a nice meal for lunch. And watch the young and restless. <laughs> These are the values that I continue to hold on, hard work, the value of faith. I thank God every single day, every single day. And I think about all of this, and I think at times we would come up to my grandmother's table, and she would say, baby, have you had enough to eat? And occasionally, I would say, I was still hungry. And she would take food off her plate and give it to me. But hear this, hear this. In this country, and in eastern North Carolina, when you pour into someone, that same kid there is able to grow up be elected as a member of Congress, and out of all committees, serve as the vice-ranking member of the House Agriculture Committee to make sure people across the country are able to access food. What a connection. And people in this room, you have been a part of this. And I thank you for that. I thank you for this. But guess what? There's so many more across the East that need us right now, that need us right now more than ever. So I'm saying to each and every one of you, we're in this fight. We're in the fight for the right reason. We're working to do it in a balanced way. We're working to do it for the Eastern North Carolina families. And we know what we're fighting for. We're fighting for our veterans. Matter of fact, I see some veterans here today. If you're a veteran, stand up right now. Let's give a big hand to every veteran that's here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We're doing it for our veterans. We're doing it for our military. We're doing this for our farmers. We're doing this for our young people. We give them a future to keep it within reach. That's why you have people like Brandon that's pouring so hard in the school board. We're trying to keep the American dream within reach. It doesn't matter your zip code or your crossroad. We can do it if we pour into our young and make sure we are committed to their future. And so many young people have left. We have a more aging population. 17 of the 19 counties lost population in the last census. That means that we're not going to give one inch on Medicare and Social Security. We have to stay in this fight for us. Our friends, we're in this fight for our communities. We're in this fight for democracy. Thank you so much for coming out. God bless each and every one of you. Before we go into questions, we know for time's sake, I probably went a little bit long. We'll take about three questions or so. But and we may not get all, but like I said, we'll just pick a few. Let's give a big hand to our law enforcement community. Yeah. Thank you for what you're doing. You know, tough jobs. And I pause to do that. Because we're now living at a day and time. I mean, I want to continue to do this to be accessible to you. But I want you to feel so comfortable and safe being here. So thank you so much again, and God bless each and every one of you. Question number one you have. We are building a new school. What is being done to make sure our children can get a good education 
and a good job when they graduate. All right. <laughs> we got to give a big shout out to um, our school board, our commissioners, legislators, everyone that's poured in um, to helping now to build a new Green Central High School. Hey! <laughs> I was sharing the, this current building uh, was built in 1961. And what's that, about 63 years or so? And I just want to put this in perspective. I don't know who's planning to be around the next 63 years to build the next school, <laughs> high school that is. Um, but that's huge for us, it really is. And not only that, to upgrade and expand. Um, in terms of our school in ways that are important. You know, when the bill, uh, when the school was originally built, perhaps we weren't thinking about a lot of the safety issues that we have to think about today. Uh, the current school, I mean, the school board members, Lisa, y'all can speak towards this so well. Um, you know, we have to truly upgrade the school. So I, I'm really pleased, you know, to be able to to see this in my lifetime. Education. I want to put this in perspective if I can. About 250 some public schools across North Carolina's first congressional district. About half of them are Title I. In other words, are in economically distressed areas. We have to make sure at the federal level because a lot of the dollars for education at the state and local level. But we have to make sure that we are getting those federal dollars and especially in economically distressed areas. We have to continue to protect access to Pell Grants, to reauthorize Pell Grants, to make sure that students who really could not afford school have access to school. We have to continue to make sure we keep in context the framework of vocational education. CTE, all this is important. Why? When we start looking, I was here at the North Community College. We presented short of a, um, a few hundred thousand dollars today to the Aviation <laughs> Academy. And what it's designed to do is to help with aviation maintenance jobs, okay? Aviation maintenance jobs. The reason this is so important, and I shared we were at Roanoke Shawan dealing with welding. I mean, there are valuable options here. And I'm going to say it this way I think we need to continue to show support and respect to educators and education as a profession. This is the truth. You can start out as a welder, and you make them way more than a first-year teacher. So we have to support. That's right, much more. So we have to continue to support vocational uh, training, education, apprenticeships. That's what I spoke on earlier. We need to continue to incentivize apprenticeships. These are federal dollars that are passed essentially through the state, and then industry is able to um, assess and engage in these apprenticeship programs. That's huge. And we need to continue to push that because that's part of that dot that I think we need to try to connect with students. And I was telling about the apprentices that I was talking, and every one of them, 100% of them said they were going to stay in Eastern North Carolina. I then asked them this question. I said, what's the greatest challenge that you have experienced with participating as a, uh, or not participate, but uh, with the apprentice, apprenticeship program. This is what they said. They stumbled into it. They weren't aware. It wasn't like readily made available for them to know about it. They just kind of, but once they found out about it, they was like, yes, and we have to continue to increase awareness. We have to continue to explore real avenues. Biotech is huge. I think there are real opportunities. We have land, we have good workforce, we have good capacity to do more bio in Eastern North Carolina. We have to do things that make sense. Here it is. Y'all heard of Mr. Beast, right? Mr. Beast. 
Mr. Beast? Okay. Now, this is the world's most famous YouTuber, y'all. He lives in our, my district right now. Okay. But this is what's going on with Mr. Beast and East Carolina University. You're taking, and they're bringing together creative content. People that come up with all this stuff. Some of the best from across the world. Bring them together to come up with curricula and offer a course to students. That's huge. You don't think that's huge? Let me tell you about Ryan real quick. Ryan is a little kid. Ryan would be on the floor playing with toys. His parents would come in and video playing with toys. They decided to put it on YouTube. And guess what? Whether you realize it or not, your kids and grandkids, they were on YouTube watching Ryan. And then they were coming to you asking for a lot of these toys. I mean, he's like, oh God, a kid. He's bringing like $4 million plus a year. Now, I was looking this stuff up. And at first, I would go home and tell the kids, clean up, clean up. But after that, I was like, no. You know, you know. <laughs> but, but we have to be creative, innovative. Global Trans Park is a key opportunity that's sitting right here, minutes away. I mean, this is the Eastern North Carolina's version of Research Triangle Park. We have to continue to develop that. And I'm talking about this because all of this links to education. You educate for the school, get them through school, give them the best education possible to make the connection, the nexus to a good paying job, a good opportunity. And I think that's what we all want in the end. Um, so I think there are many things I could you know, definitely go on, but you know, this is part of the vision that I see. And we have to continue to even make college, keep it affordable within reach. Okay. So y'all only realize Sante's like, okay, we're getting tired. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I've been dealing with this for, what, 20 some years? I am a veteran. What are you doing to help our soldiers and our veterans with their benefits? Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> yeah, he said that's a good question. First of all, uh, come up here, Robert Lee, please, again. This is such an important concern of mine. We have over 56,000 veterans in the 1st Congressional District that we brought somebody in and this is his focus. But not only that, let me share his background. This man standing before us right here served in the United States Air Force. He wasn't, I guess, totally pleased. So and I'm trying to figure this out. He went into the Coast Guard and he became a chief. I mean, it's like the highest rank you can get. Um, he was serving um, in Northampton County as a veteran service officer, the VSO. And for me, I didn't want just to have anybody. I wanted to have someone that was a veteran, someone that understood these issues. And he was working a lot of cases at the county level. So it's like, hey, come on. We want you to come. He accepted the offer, and he's been knee-deep working on a lot of issues. As a matter of fact, I want to share... We have um, some more veteran roundtables coming up um, later in the month, and we'll be moving around. Let's give Robert Lee a hand, y'all. We're going to be moving around, coming to communities, counties across the East, having these conversations for veterans. But the reason I want to call Robert Lee up, I want you to see him, put a face with a name. If you have an issue, you know anyone with an issue, give us a call. Again, that's why we are here. We are here for you. If anybody with an issue, go see him tonight. Now, that's on the constituency front. On the policy front, we're working on all kinds of bills. Um, we have a bill helping veterans um, streamline the process for the benefits. Um, here's the thing. May a person go search, lose a limb or anything, and they come back and they're having to go through so many challenges just to connect to a benefit that they have rightfully earned. 
Yeah, so we're going to continue to work to streamline that. And, um, you know, we have a bill to do that. We have another bill, which um, we've been looking at. And this idea came from sitting in a round table. And that was, we know that veterans are having challenges when then they say, okay, go get your medical records. And it's like, okay, I've been out of service. And, you know, it's like, where do we start this process? And then sometimes we, we need to ex expedite that process um, in terms of being able to connect even to the medical records. So I put it this way, this is a topic, I am a veteran that's very near and dear to me. And there's so many issues that we're working on um, on this front. Um, another one's dealing with their loans when they're uh, student loans. Um, they've had issues. Um, they're cutting off their ability to go to school. We're trying to streamline that process so that we can work to um, work through um, um, any overpayments. So I'm not trying to bore everybody on this stuff, but I'm just saying there's a lengthy list of issues that we've been working on. And the biggest thing I would say is if you have a specific issue tonight, tonight, please go see this, this gentleman right here. And um, he's going to help you do everything you can. Okay, this definitely will be the last one. <laughs> will the farm bill ever get passed? The farm bill. Uh oh. That must be your. <laughs> um, the farm bill. Let me share with you. The farm bill was passed out of committee. Um, it's sitting in rules. Uh, the route that it is, we were actually supposed to be in D.C. this week. Um, there were some disagreements that's taking place. And so they basically shut down session for this week. Um, effectively, we do not go back to Washington um, until September the 9th. And then there's only about nine to 10 legislative days left um, before November. And everybody will start focusing on November um, 5th. And the point that I'm making, I think the most realistic answer to that question is the current farm bill was extended to the end of September. I see us coming back in September and having to extend it once again. Now, when is it extended? How far is the extension? There's different conversations on that. Some would like to see a, a short extension and possibly do it in a lame duck se session. Some would be supportive of a more extended extension another year or so. Um, but those are some of the conversations that's been taking place. At the end of the day, we have to get to a very good bipartisan farm bill. We have to work to make sure that we're not shutting down farms. And at the same time, I do want to be clear, we have to make sure too, as I was talking about earlier, you know, that we are addressing um, needs with nutrition. You know, we have um, nutrition programs out there. So, um, you know, right now, I would say that I would say an extension is, is most likely imminent at this point. Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate you. Um, I'll still kind of be around um, if you want to come up, if you want to see Robert, if you want to see any of the, the staff members, please, I'm going to ask the team to come out. If you have any questions, again, we do this because we are here for you. I want you to put faces with names so that if you call in the office, stopping by the office, that you know who's in place to serve you. Could I have one question? Um, I put it this way. We've been holding people at this time, and they've been gracious. And what I would like to do is, is go ahead and dismiss, but I, I would love to answer your question personally. Thanks. Have a good night, everybody.